Thank you for being with me today as we have our Sunday School lesson. My name is Tim Bell, and our Bible study today is going to be taken from Corinthians. Um, I'm um, a member of Northside Baptist Church, and as I come along today to serve you and to learn with you and to teach about the Scriptures, I pray that the Spirit will guide you in all that you do. You may be having troubles and difficulties right now in some of the things that, that's going on in your life, and we'll pray for you and pray for others who you may know of. So thank you for sharing, for tuning in today, and I pray that as we are ministered by the Spirit, that He will lift you up and give you insights into His Word, which will make your life more blessed and more happy and more determined to do what God wants you to do. So let's have a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for loving us and for working with us, for giving us this day and for sharing with us your love and the power of your spirit. Help us as we go through all of our struggles. Help us to be grateful for the good things that we have. Thank you for the good things we have in Jesus Christ. And we ask, Lord, that you would bless us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, um, if you'll turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23 through 24. The Corinthian church was kind of a tough church for Paul to deal with. The, the uh, church at Corinth was a very um, secular, you know, city, a secular town. There was a lot of trade that went through it. It's a very important uh, port there for um, for Rome and for a lot of the things that went through there. It was important that the individuals who lived there were aware of what was going on because there were all kinds of people from all regions and everything else. And so it brought in a lot of uh, problems and a different set of situations that were peculiar to the church at Corinth. So we're going to look at uh, some of these today. And uh, as, as we do, uh, let me just mention to you that Paul was talking to the people at Corinth. They were, uh, if you look at your history, they were um, inhabited by the Greeks that were overtaken by the Romans. So basically it was Roman culture. Um, it was during this time about when persecutions of the Christians were about ready to start and begin. They didn't get really bad for another 40 years, but people were looking down on Christians. They were looking, looked at as a cult group and they uh, you know, got a lot of flack from the people that was in the area. And so uh, Paul is instructing to them. Apparently somebody asked him this question. Uh, and so he's answering the question. He's probably in jail at the time, and he is answering this question in a letter, and they send it back to Corinth, take it to the church leaders so that they can make heads or tails out of the situation that's come along. Uh, apparently, somebody has asked Paul. They've said, look, Paul, the problem here is that we have people who are supposedly Christian people, but they are eating meat that's been sacrificed to idols. Should they be doing that? Is that permissible for them to do that? Should they, um, you know, just just refuse to do it and stand on the grounds of their Jewish traditions? Or exactly where should they stand and what should they do? The Corinthian church had a lot of Christians in it that had become, uh, that had come from the, from Jewish background. So they had a lot of these Jewish ideas that they had in their minds. A lot of them thought you had to actually be circumcised and become a Jew before you could become a Christian. But Paul refuted this in later, some of the later letters that he wrote. Um, but uh, this particular instance is something that uh, I think gives us great insights into how we need to live today as Christians and how we need to treat one another and the importance of being uh, a tolerant of where other people stand in a relationship to Christ. So let's let's read the um, the, the first verses there, chapter 10, verse 23. It, he says, everything, Paul says, everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible, but not everything builds up. No one is to seek his own good, but the good of the other person. Now, what Paul is saying here is that not everything that you do is permissible. Wur uh, murder, um, pr sexual promiscuity, um, you know, uh, slothfulness, being lazy, not carrying out the work that you're supposed to do, uh, cheating, stealing. He didn't say that those things were, were permissible, but there are some things that the people brought to Paul asking him about what they should and should not do. So Paul is taking 
basically focusing in on some of the Jewish rites and Jewish traditions and some of the thoughts that young Christians may have that they're really unsure of. And so Paul said most things that deal with, uh, with um, uh, secular laws or religious laws that are based on the law and not based on what Jesus taught, most of those things are permissible to do. For instance, uh, Jesus told Peter that he could eat um, shellfish and other things, uh, impure things, that uh, in, in a dream. He said, you know, that's the Jewish people weren't supposed to do that, but it's okay if you do that now because it's all good food. It all comes from God. And so these are the kind of things that he was talking about. Now, if you look at yourself and you look at some of the things that are going on, even in our church, you'll see that there are some things that you can really do and you feel like that you're capable of doing, but you're not going to do them because they may be uh, an influence on other people. Uh, for, for instance, some people uh, mow their grass on Sundays. Is there anything in the Bible that says do not mow your grass on Sundays? No, but there are some things that say that, that, that there is one law that says keep the commandment and keep it holy uh, at the, uh, in the Ten Commandments. So, uh, so some people will say that means don't cut your grass and it means, um, you know, be sure and do um, all the things that will not cause you to work. Uh, you may be a nurse, you may be a doctor. You may have a job where you have to go to work. You may be a paper carrier. You may, uh, be, you know, you may work at a grocery store at a drugstore where things have to be kept open, and so you are forced basically to have to go to work. You may work at a restaurant where a lot of people come after church, and so you may be forced uh, to to work, uh, even though it's the Lord's day. Uh, so, so how would how would you interpret that as a Christian? Uh, Probably, I mean, I would interpret it as the Lord's day is that we need to give uh, homage to the Lord on his day. We need to worship him on that day. We need to study his word. Uh, we need to be a part of his church family. Now, that doesn't mean that it has to necessarily, I, I think, take take uh, place on the Lord's day on Sunday because the Sabbath was actually the day in the Old Testament, but that was changed to the Lord's Day in the New Testament, it was changed on Sunday because that's when Jesus rose from the dead. So so you could have people, and I have people who have argued with me that the Sabbath should be, that the Lord's Day should be celebrated on Saturday instead of Sunday. Well, you know, you know, to me, that is not um, an important issue. You celebrate it whenever you can. And when you celebrate it, you're celebrating the other days. You're not just celebrating setting aside one day to be holy, you're setting aside one day to worship God in order to let him know that you realize the whole week is holy. It's not just that one day. And so if you want to mow your grass on Sunday, you know, that's up to you. I don't think that that's going to, I don't think that's a sin if you do, but it could be if your neighbors are not Christians or are young Christians and kind of uh, trying to feel the ropes and they haven't gotten to the level that you've gotten to yet. Mowing your grass on Sunday may be detrimental to them. And Paul would say, don't do that. It's not necessary. Don't do that. It's okay to do it as far as God is concerned. Because I just read to you, it says everything is permissible, these kinds of things. But but not everything that's permissible is necessarily the best thing. It's not necessarily, as Paul says, beneficial. And then he says it's not, and, and, and it may not build up. So if you've got some things that you do that you see uh, that other Christians or other people or non-Christians, um, if they will see that as a bad example for what you're doing, uh, then you're not to do it. Paul simply says, yeah, then you shouldn't do it. And he gives an example of that, but one right here is like uh, on the Lord's Day. Another thing is, as a Christian, should you eat out? Should you go to a restaurant uh, on Sunday where you have people who are being forced to work because you want to eat out? Uh, you know, here again, uh, you may have some waiters and waitresses. You may have some other people that you know of that think that that's wrong. I knew people who never wrote checks on Sunday because they thought that was like doing work and you weren't supposed to do that. So did I think that was wrong? No. But would I write a check on Sunday? Sure. But would I write a check on Sunday in their presence where they would uh, know that what I was doing was violating what they thought was actually wrong. No, I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't write the check on Sunday. I'd wait and write it on Monday. That was going to cause some problems with them because that would not be beneficial. You know, some things, for instance, drinking, there's nothing good about drinking. Nothing comes good out of drinking. 
Um, but there's a lot of bad things that can come from drinking. Now I'm talking about drinking alcohol where you can get drunk, etc. So, so, so why, why do it then? Why drink if you're not going to get anything good out of it and only bad things? Now, if you have a beer periodically or you drink and don't get intoxicated, what's the Bible say about that? It says don't drink too much. It doesn't say that you shouldn't drink at all. So I would say as a Christian, if I see you drinking, that's fine with me. It's not going to hurt my, my witness, but I would never drink, uh, you know, in, in front of anybody, simply because I'm afraid it may hurt my witness to a weaker brother or sister, especially a Christian who sees me drinking, knowing that I'm a minister, who sees me drinking, knowing that I'm a Christian, knowing that I'm um, uh, uh, teaching this t teaching this in a Baptist church, knowing that I teach young kids in the Baptist church in Sunday school. Uh, do you think that I would uh, risk that by drinking alcohol? Uh, what good is it going to do me? Not really any good at all. It can only do harm. So just be careful. Don't do something that is not beneficial or is not going to build up people. That's what Paul says to do. Do those things. Don't do the things that are questionable. And here again, I'm not going to debate on what's right and what's wrong if it's not in the Bible. Uh, smoking, you know, that's not in the Bible. Doesn't even talk about that. So do I think smoking's okay for a Christian? Well, I'm not condemning you if you want to smoke. That's up to you. But it can have a negative impact on non-Christians or Christians who are growing and trying to focus on what God wants them to do. And they're looking to you as an example. So does that mean that God expects more from you than from other people? Yes, he certainly does. The more responsibility you have, the more uh, God expects from you. The higher up in the church you are as far as how people see you, you know, if you're a, um, you go to church every Sunday, you, you bring your Bible, uh, you may be a deacon, you may be um, an elder, you may be uh, the treasurer, you may be the church secretary, you may be, you know, the pastor, all kind, you know, you could be all kinds of things, the music uh, leader, uh, you may be the various ministers within the church. Do you think that the church would condone you to smoke and drink? To where other people could see you? Uh, no, uh, they wouldn't condone that because it is going to be hard on your ministry. It will be hard on bringing new people to the church because they can use that same old uh, tag of you're a hypocrite. Now, you may not really be, but that's how, what they come up with. Um, so, I mean, so here again, I, you know, I have no problem with that. I used to visit people a, a lot and sometimes they wouldn't know I was coming or if they did, they forgot that they had liquor sitting out and what have you. And they would hide it and do this and that with it. You know that, that you know that that never bothered me. Um, if they want to drink in the privacy of their own home, you know that's totally up to them. Um, I, I didn't condemn them. I don't think it was a sin necessarily. Um, it could turn into one if it gets out of control, etc. But uh, you know, as far as I'm concerned, that's between them and God. And and I never. Um, I, I was a mature enough Christian where I could overlook things like that. And, and just see the good in the person and really what they're doing is, isn't that, you know, it, it, it didn't affect me anyway. Um, but, but it can some people, it can other people, weaker people, weaker Christians. And that's what Paul was saying to be careful. Of. Let me give you the example Paul gives. He says, eat everything that is sold in the meat market without raising questions for the sake of conscience since the earth is the Lord's and all that is in it. If any one of the unbelievers invites you over and you want to go eat everything that is set before you without raising questions for the sake of conscience. But if someone says to you, this is food from a sacrifice, do not eat it out of consideration for the one who told you or for the sake of conscience. I do not mean your own conscience, but the other person's. For why is my freedom judged by another person's conscience? If I partake with thanksgiving, why am I criticized because of something for which I give thanks? Okay, so let's kind of I get a little background on that. You see, um, in this particular time, there were, there were a lot of meats that were worshipped uh, to these false gods and goddesses in Corinth. And when they were finished being worshipped up, they weren't consumed all the time and they were sold on the, on the uh, market. In the, in the meat market. And so people would purchase these and they would eat them. 
and Christians were saying we shouldn't be buying these and eating them because they've been worshipped to idols and therefore it is not the proper thing to do. We would be sinning if we took these things and ate them. Especially we would be sinning if we did it in front of other people. And so Paul says, okay, here's the deal. The, the idols are non-existent as far as the goddess or gods that they represent. They're non-existent. So this, this meat that's been offered to them, it, 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 it has not done anything to it as far as cursed it or anything else. It's the same meat, whether it was worship or whether it was used and sacrificed or not. It's the same thing. So you go out on the meat market and you buy it. And then somebody takes it home and invites you over to their home to eat. So you go up there to their home and, and here's the meat and you're sitting down and you're saying, okay, I'm going to eat everything because I want to be, a, you know, a, a, a good guest. I don't want to do something that would hurt their feelings. You you know, I mean, I know I've been to a lot of uh, homes where they would serve me things that I didn't particularly like or want, but I would eat it just because I wanted to show respect for the time and consideration that they took in preparing this for me. And so, you know, I, I never, I know some kids, some people will go, oh, you know, when you tell them what they're having. And that's highly disrespectful. And it's, um, just, you know, and it, it, it's very uh, non-grateful to somebody who's gone through, you know, trying to prepare something that they think that you might like. So you don't do that. I don't do that in general. So if you're sitting down at a meal and things are given to you, then you go ahead and eat it. Uh, now, apparently this one person or whoever it was that sent this letter to Paul said, but I was sitting down here at the table and somebody told me that that meat was offered to false gods. It was some of the meat that was uh, offered to the idols uh, the, of the uh, Corinthian um, cult. And so Paul says, now that gives you a little different set of, of, of instructions and in what to do and how to handle it. Paul says, because you have other people that you may offend by eating it, you'd be better off not eating it. You may, um, especially if the host, you know, is, is there, it, he mentions the host and their conscience and somebody else who's there. So everybody is aware that it was served uh, in the meat market that had been sacrificed. And so you, 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 you don't want to be rude to the host or hostess, so you would have normally eaten it but now somebody brings up to the fact that it has been uh, defiled and we shouldn't really be eating it. So what is your response? So your response is this, it's permissible for me to eat this. It's not, it will not hurt me. God said I can eat it. Uh, God told Peter in a dream that he can eat it, but I'm not gonna eat it because we have some people here who think that it's wrong to eat it. And I'm not gonna eat it because I don't want my Christian witness to be defiled by what I do and they think less of me and it may hurt them and harm them in their Christian walk and they may look down on me as a hypocrite or not as a leader or what have you. Paul is saying if you are seen as a Christian you have a lot of potential. You have uh, leadership abilities. You have inroads that go into these people's lives and they may confide in you about certain things but if they see you eat this meat they're not going to have any confidence in you at all, and they're going to totally cut you off. And that's going to leave you with a lot less opportunities to serve them and to be a helper for them and to guide them along the Christian path. So Paul is saying, even though it's permissible, and that's total freedom, even though it's permissible freedom, it is not the best thing to do. It's not the most expedient thing to do because you may cause trouble and you may cause harm with the weak brothers. So Paul said, love is the key. Love is the key. Uh, are you really going to, uh, I mean, is, is your freedom that, that important or you're going to put the person, push them aside, the importance of their life and the importance of your commitment with them together? Are you really going to just erase that and get rid of it just because you want to, uh, do something that you think is perfectly all right to do, but it may cause harm in the long run. Who would do that? Some people would. They would say, look, I have a right to do this, and I'm not going to stop and do it. I'm going to do it because I want to do it. And there's nothing you could say that's going to change my mind. These people need to get over it. And there is a case for that. These weak Christians really need to get over that. They need to... Um, to um, 
accept the fact of what God, of what Jesus taught, what God taught, and that uh, all food is clean. Remember, Jesus said what you take in your body um, is, is uh, you don't have to worry about taking unclean things into your body. It's what comes out of your body. And so he he said that the uh, eating physical food, etc., had little to do with your spiritual life, with your internal life, with the love that you had for other people. And so what Paul is saying is, take that and use that as a guideline that what other people expect of you, then then do that. You know, do what they expect you to do if if it's in a Christian sense. There was a banker, I may have just used this illustration before, there was a banker that I knew, and, and but it's a good illustration. He was the president of the bank and uh, they were having a meeting and everybody cussed, but he was a Christian, came to our church and he told me, he said, so one day I threw out a few profanities because I just want to kind of fit in with the crowd. And um, he said, you know, I, I didn't think there was anything wrong with that. There are other people were, you know, using profanity, et cetera. And so I didn't think there was any big deal. And he said, uh, afterward, a guy came up to him and he said, you know, I expect all these other people to curse because they do. And I'm around them all the time. But uh, I was really surprised when you did. So his Christian witness was was uh, dampened by th this this one man that saw what he was doing. And he was very upset with him. Um, and that's the way it is in your life, too. You just have to be careful in what you do. It may not be wrong. It may not be a sin, but it could be seen as a sin by other people who are, you know, who are um, less mature spiritually than you are. And so you ask the question, well, that's their problem, isn't it? Well, it is their problem, unfortunately, but it's even more of a problem because you need to love them. You need to do with them for them. You need to do what is permissible and what is uh, acceptable in their eyes. Uh, I had, um, I, I used to, after I retired, I worked with some of the VA clients and one of the families, uh, it, 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 they were North Korean, uh, I'm sorry, South Korean. And when I would go into their home, we'd always have to take our shoes off. We'd have to, but they had a place there to take your shoes off. And when I got there, the housekeeper told me that she didn't demand that you take them off, but she would appreciate it if you would. I always took my shoes off when I went there simply because, um, you know, I, I wanted to, I wanted the, the, the people there to know that I was their friend, that I was willing to do whatever that it took, if it was not anti-Christian, to do whatever it took in order to feel more at home and to respect them. And that was a small thing to do. I didn't think it was necessary. I don't, I don't take my shoes off at home, but I did it for her because that's what she wanted. And that was according to their customs. So that's what Paul's talking about. You know, do you really love people? Are you willing to give up a few things out of love for other people? Uh, is it really that important to, to take care of these little vices that you have or to carry out um, things that are questionable? Uh, no, it's better not to. It's better just to forget it and to, out of love, do go the extra mile in not showing disrespect or showing uh, that you don't understand what other people are going through at the time. Okay, so so Paul Paul talks about that quite a bit, and then we're going to look at the verse thirty one, kind of closed, kind of close out here. And here's what he says to kind of put it all together. He says, "So whether you eat or drink, whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God." Whether you eat or drink, do it for the glory of God. Give no offense to Jews or Greeks or the church of God, just as I also try to please everyone in everything, not seeking my own benefit, but the benefit of many, so that they may be saved. Now, Paul kind of puts all this together, and he puts a really important spin on what he's been saying. He's saying, you know, I'm not going to demand my own way. Jesus didn't demand his own way. When Jesus went out and, and did things and, and showed his his love for other people and people mocked him and made fun of him, he didn't demand his own way. He didn't curse them or knock them down or make them change. He respected people. He loved people. And he just went about doing what he knew that his Father in Heaven wanted him to do. And so whenever he ate or drank, as you read through different things, he said that he did it all for the glory of God. Uh, and then Paul says, don't offend the Jews or don't offend um, the Greeks or other people 
that are members of the Church of God if they're not mature enough to deal with what you're talking about. So we've talked about this already. And Paul said, here's the reason for that. There may be opportunities that you will have to tell them about the love and the convicting spirit of Jesus Christ. You will have opportunities probably in your lifetime or in the times that you share with these individuals about telling them about Jesus Christ and how he can be the savior of their life and how can and how he can be Lord of their life. But if people see you as, quote, sinners, even though you're really not, if they see you as that, they're going to turn you off. And they're not going to be interested in what you have to say. So Jesus says, take, you know, walk the second mile. Yes, people aren't as mature as you are. Thank the Lord that you're mature in your, your faith or maturing and you grow every day. Thank the Lord that you're at that part point in your life where you can read some scriptures and understand what they're saying and that you can feel God's Holy Spirit in your life as he directs you and gives you hope and gives you help for the decisions that you make. Thank God for that. You know, thank you, Lord. You know, I'm way ahead of most people. If I've got that much going for me. Thank you for somebody a long time ago that told me about Jesus Christ, somebody I respected, somebody that, that I did not see that had any... Uh, um, animosity in them, but just love for me. Thank you for that person and for their their uh, uh, opportunity to tell me about Jesus Christ. And Paul says, if you give up a few of these little things that don't really amount to anything, all of these things that bring you just a little bit of pleasure, if you give those things up, you will open doors in many cases to opportunities to tell these people who would be witnessing what you're doing and watching the steps that you take uh, to 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 do the right thing, and they will say this is a, is a person who I haven't really seen anything like this. They are above reproach, basically, and they're going to tell me about and they and they they told me about Jesus Christ, and that's who leads them. They're not judgmental people. They're not hateful people. They don't point their fingers at me. They don't ridicule me. They're kind to me. They're kind to others as I can see them. They're patient. They're not violent. They don't lose their temper. They're, they're, they're very calm individual people who uh, just walk the road of being uh, very uh, strong and very stable. And that's the kind of person that I want to know about Jesus Christ from because I know they'll be giving me the straight scoop. That's what Paul is saying. If you do these things and love people above things, love things above inconveniences that you may suffer because of it, even though, you know, um, you may have to give up some things that you don't think are wrong, uh, but you may have to give them up so that God, through you, can bring people to know Jesus Christ. So that's a great thing and a great honor that you have. And and uh, Paul is, is telling us here, and the Holy Spirit is convicting us, on what he wants us to do. So let's uh, let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the freedom that we have as Christians, but we also thank you, Lord, that the freedom needs to be tempered with love. So help us to love one another. Help us to give up what we have in order to make opportunities and open doors that we may lead others to Jesus Christ. Thank you for our time together. In Jesus' name, amen.